on today's World Insight with Tian Wei. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are slipping behind schedule. What is needed to deliver these ambitious goals on time? And we meet Steve McIvor, the CEO of World Animal Protection, who explains the importance of biodiversity. Coexist with people. Yeah. It is a difficult challenge, and it's a challenge that China faces. As And here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. We start our show today in New York, where heads of state and government gather together to follow up on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is called the UN SDG Summit. Prior to the summit, the United Nations released a new report illuminating how action taken immediately or not taken will determine the existence of humanity. It says humanity now stands at a crossroad. Climate protesters brought the streets of the U.S. Capitol to a standstill Monday, one of the many civil disruptions aimed at world leaders in New York attending the U.N. Climate Action Summit. Action because so far there hasn't been enough to stave off a climate catastrophe. Nature is angry and we fool ourselves if we think we can fool nature, because nature always strikes back, and around the world, nature is striking back with fury. The race is on to avoid a global temperature rise of two degrees Celsius. Scientists say that can't happen unless countries and corporations step up their commitments. There are some bright spots. China, the world's largest carbon emitter, is on target to meet its commitments and may well reach them early. China's foreign minister promised a world in harmony between man and nature. Since 2000, China has contributed a quarter of the world's newly forested land. Last year, China saw an increase of one and a quarter million new energy vehicles, outnumbering many other countries. China is also actively developing a national emissions trading market. Wang Yi said China would honor its words on climate change. Others are not. U.S. President Trump visited the summit but stayed only a few minutes. His administration is rolling back U.S. emission standards for cars and corporations alike. The race against the climate catastrophe is not running in humanity's favor. The U.N. wants the world to be carbon neutral by 2050. But at the current rate, the world will warm, scientists say, by 4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. If nature is angry now, it could get a lot worse. For more on UN Sustainable Development Goals, we have in Washington David Livingston, Deputy Director of Climate and Advanced Energy at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. Welcome to the program. Joining us in Beijing, we have Zhou Ji, CEO and President of Energy Foundation in China. Mr. Livingston, how much expectation should we really have for the summit on climate change? I think there are high expectations, uh, largely because of the leadership of the UN Secretary General, who I think has done a very good job of ensuring that the pressure is on key economies uh, to not just come with words and rhetoric uh, to the UN meeting, but to really come with increased ambition and commitments ranging across sectors as diverse as transportation, agriculture, industrial, uh, industrial decarbonization, uh, natural climate solutions, etc. So I hope that we're going to see the result of that pressure be concrete new commitments um, and concrete new partnerships, uh, including some, some key public-private partnerships, working with uh, important industrial players mm -hmm. that will result in new emissions uh, trajectories which will uh, decarbonize some key economies faster right. than was the pace coming into this week's meetings. Having said that, though, Mr. Zhou, one of the things the world is facing right now is struggling with the priorities. Now, you have a lot of things going on, geopolitics, economy. What's next between some of the biggest economies in the world? Uh, what do you think will a sustainable development still be on the top of the priority for many of the economies? Uh, I would say uh, uh, the development and the peace continue to be the, uh, the main 
mainstream uh, tone for the whole world. We should never forget that this is the the ultimate goal uh -huh. we need to achieve. Well, probably we should never forget, but the question is, have some already forgotten? Because if you look at the recent exchanges of words among some of the economies and countries, certainly that is worrisome. So Mr. Livingston, when some of the biggest economies in the world are not subscribing to the goals that the UN has committed through the multilateral platform, how much can we expect about the result? Well, certainly, it's, um, it, it's difficult to decarbonize the global economy with all countries working together in sync. It's, of course, even more difficult to do that uh, when the backdrop is uh, rising geopolitical tensions and uncertainty and the end, not the beginning, of an uh, economic cycle. Um, not everything can be done through the multilateral framework. Not everything can be done through the UN system. And I think there's a recognition of that. The UN system uh, should exist to help bridge some geopolitical and, and uh, diplomatic challenges in sending the right policy signals and sending the right policy messages and in getting leaders to go in the right direction of travel. But ultimately, when it comes to implementation, it will require a robust set of public-private partnerships which, which the UN can help to catalyze, uh, but, but which it will need other sectors and other uh, players and stakeholders to mm. help carry through. Mm. Um, and so I think that we should be uh, reticent about putting too much emphasis on the UN as the locus of all decarbonization activity that will be needed in the decades ahead. Mm. Mr. Livingston is focusing on the public-private partnership, of course, the PPP, but at the same time, uh, Mr. Zhou, uh, you have already countries' economies committed to the goals of sustainable development the UN put out for everyone. Now, uh, you have uh, divergent roles uh, that different economies have chosen. Uh, it's just very difficult and challenging to see how those goals will be achieved. The sustainable development certainly is the key word here. Um, uh, I think uh, although UN cannot figure out uh, everything, but uh, this is a place, uh, I mean, for making uh, right political signal uh, to reaffirm the commitment, national commitment, and also uh, to prove uh, this is the, uh, the fundamental trend. And uh, coming back to when people had the, the summit and uh, they came back home, uh, and then they developed their uh, national strategy and the plan and uh, developed uh, policies for specific sectors uh, like in uh, industry, the transport, building, uh, household, uh, consumption, etc., etc., uh, to make them align with the fundamental trends of low carbon uh, growth. Mm. One of the things people talk about, Mr. Livingston, is what about those who still subscribe to the idea and who still want to proactively participate in uh, trying to contribute to the Sustainable Development Goals achievement? So uh, what about those players? Let's just say if the United States as a government is not interested, what kinds of space does it create for the others to fill in the vacuum? Uh, let's just say European countries, Asian economies, China included, India included. Uh, what do you say, Mr. Livingston? Well, I'd push back on the notion that the U.S. isn't interested at all in the Sustainable Development Goals or in uh, uh, international climate discussions. I think you still see a robust participation at the climate talks, not only, of course, from uh, the typical uh, State Department bureaucrats who have been engaging in this process for quite a long time, but more importantly, from broader aspects of the U.S. economy and society. You've had uh, a, a strong showing of support for the Paris Agreement from uh, more than half of, of U.S. states. Um, you have hundreds of mayors across the United States who have committed to meeting the goals of the Paris uh, Agreement. You have thousands of companies who have committed the same. And I think it's important to recognize that in the United States, at least, most energy policy uh, is set at the state level, not at the federal level. And so though there are some unfortunate um, uh, symbolic step backwards in terms of the rhetoric that might be coming out of the White House on climate change from time to time. In terms of actions that really matter, a lot of the important progress in the United States is taking place at the subnational level. Uh, state governments, city governments, corporate actors, universities, mm. uh, pension funds and financial players, etc. 
Um, and so I would, I would emphasize uh, uh, that climate progress might come from surprising places, and it's not just about the rhetoric coming out of world leaders' mouths. It's also about real policy mechanisms. Mm. Uh, Mr. Zhou, on the other hand, let me ask you about China's issue. Okay. The economy is having certain kinds of challenges as a result of geopolitics, trade wars, and also the economic cycle, restructuring of the economy, just to name a few. At this point, there is also a struggle of priorities, Mr. Zhou. Mm -hmm. Whether you look at the GDP number or you look at the qualities behind the GDP number in which sustainable development is a key player there. Mr. Zhou, what is your understanding of the general temperature? Uh, in, uh, in fact, I do see very high consistency between uh, low carbon uh, and the environmentally friendly economy and uh, uh, the growth, uh, the development, uh, development itself. Uh, so why? Because um, uh, climate change and the uh, environment themselves are development issues rather than something else. Uh, and if we can move forward for low carbon transition, so in fact uh, we create a new driver, new engine for uh, the sustainable uh, prosperity, for uh, the, uh, the new growth in the coming decades. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we create a more job opportunity, more source of revenue for central and the local government. So that means that we should never, I mean, make the two uh, against uh, to each other, I mean, uh, development and uh, climate change. When you say that, of course, you're coming from the Energy Foundation. I mean, your job is to work on sustainable development uh, and its relations with energy, but there are many other that departments, organizations whose priority is uh, different from yours. So Mr. Zhou, those are the challenging parts as to uh, when the economy is relatively slowing down, when uncertainties are becoming ever bigger. So what's going to be the choices people make? Will there be a give and take so-called uh, choice that people have to make when it comes to sustainable development, Mr. Zhou? Yeah, in fact, this is a matter of uh, reallocate the resources. Uh, anyway, we have the same goal, the same motivation uh, to make growth, to uh, ensure the economy uh, prospecting. Mm. Um, I mean, in terms of job opportunities, in terms of uh, uh, money making, and uh, you can make money by uh, fossil fuel. You can also make money by uh, renewable. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, we can benefit from renewable much more I mean, in terms of uh, air quality, health, energy security, and also the market. And recently, uh, yeah, the past year have seen a uh, very rapid decline of the, the cost uh, uh -huh. of renewable. And if you have better and better, high, higher quality energy, why not? And uh, if you uh, have innovation, mm. I mean, to introduce new energy, to ensure your economy uh, uh, sustainable, why not? And uh, in the meantime, this is also a matter of uh, idea and views of development. We should consider okay. transgeneration sustainability. So mm -hmm. we should not only, uh, I mean, make money for making money. So we should make, uh, I mean, the revenue distributed, okay. not only among different groups, but also uh, among different generations. Theories are easy to illustrate. However, when it comes to real actions, how to have real actions, how to correlate different kinds of interest groups and make sure the policies will go exactly in the direction that people would prefer to, that's the real challenge over here. It is being believed widely, Mr. Livingston and Mr. Zhou, that China and the United States can work together on climate change issue. That at least was true during the last administration in the U.S. With the political changes going on inside the United States, Mr. Livingston, will climate change still be an issue that the U.S. and China could have as a common ground when the two countries are struggling to find common topics to work together and build at least a certain degrees of trust? It's a great question, and I do think that there's still scope for collaboration between China and the United States on climate change. As you noted, indeed, it's one of the areas in a, 
in an otherwise very complex uh, multivariate relationship um, where the mo some of the most positive uh, cooperation can take place. Um, we share, China and the United States, a number of challenges and opportunities that are not zero-sum, uh, but in which cooperation can actually create value for both sides. This includes collaborating on adapting to the climate change which is already happening and making sure that our communities and societies are resilient. But it also goes to uh, collaborating on the development of the technologies which will be needed to decarbonize our industrial sectors, our power sectors, our transport sectors in the years to come. Mm. China and the U.S. share robust manufacturing uh, sectors that we should be working together on to develop solutions. Um, mm. For example, ways of making steel that are not so carbon intensive, finding ways to use uh, zero carbon hydrogen uh, in the industrial sector, collaborating on uh, uh, lowering trade barriers for green goods, um, electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, batteries, etc. Um, while at the same time still minding our national interests, but in a prudent way, so that uh, we don't uh, uh, unnecessarily um, uh, interrupt cooperation on the climate issue. Uh, I think that there's still great scope for doing this, mm. uh, but it'll take, it'll take wise and, and, and cool heads at the table um, identifying these areas and quarantining them from, uh, uh, from a relationship with, which otherwise might be much more complex. Mr. Livingston, I'm a journalist, therefore I always want to remind people of the reality. The reality is there are strong voices in some of the two countries uh, that advocating decoupling, including decoupling of technology, decoupling of trade cooperation, decoupling of academic research, and certainly decoupling on um, some of the issues that both of you, you and Mr. Zhou, are passionate about. So uh, how should we understand the general trend? The general trend is decoupling, or the general trend is the beautiful picture that you said uh, it's necessary and must for the two countries to seek um, common ground. What's your sense, uh, Mr. Livingston? Well, if we want to talk about the reality of things, it's probably not binary. It's probably not either or. Um, mm -hmm. I think that in some sectors, in, IC, uh, in information technology, etc., there certainly seems to be a number of drivers pushing towards decoupling. However, that doesn't necessarily extend to all technology. And, you know, on, on that front, I would note there's, um, uh, th there seems to be no, no great decoupling when it comes to trade in wind turbines, when it comes to trade in, in solar modules, mm. uh, nor should we expect there to be a decoupling when it comes to trade in, you know, new uh, processes for primary steel production, uh, or for, you know, or for cement production, which are lower carbon. There can be a healthy degree of competition. Indeed, uh, just as you would hope for firms competing in the market to, to, to use that competition to drive better products at lower mm -hmm. costs, one can hope that that's the nature of, of healthy competition between the U.S. and China in this field. Um, but if we can, if we can, in certain technologies, right. which, which don't, are, aren't sensitive from a security perspective, but which are needed to address climate change, if we can work towards greater uh, volume of trade and more free trade in these products and services, I think that that's a, uh, something which can coexist alongside, uh -huh. for, as I noted before, perhaps more complex dynamics in other areas of the technology. Uh, Mr. Zhou, what do you make of that issue? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, climate change is a global issue. So nobody can uh, escape the, from uh, this challenge. And the, the two countries, the U.S. and the China, uh, the people in the two countries, we, we suffer from the same challenges, the same negative impacts. And uh, having said that, uh, there is no excuse for us to, uh, to, uh, to meet the challenges separately. We should uh, cooperate to address the same challenge, global challenge. And in the meantime, uh, we also see uh, a huge uh, potential for cooperation. Uh, I mean, at uh, uh, sub-national level, I mean, between province and the, two, uh, and, and the states, mm -hmm. and the sector by sector. So just now, uh, David mentioned the, the carbon capture and the storage uh, area. I think uh, this is especially yeah. uh, applicable to China and with a very high share of coal, uh, I mean, uh, in, in, in the primary energy. And uh, so having said that, uh, in terms of market technology, uh, uh, risk uh, uh, suffer from, uh, I mean, uh, for, uh, by people. Uh, we have no excuse 
uh, I mean, to decouple uh, our cooperation. Mm. Well, it's very encouraging to hear both of your voices. Of course, your advocates of the cause will see how uh, those voices will be spreading around and how the debates would eventually uh, taking place about the issues that both of you are passionate about. Thank you so much, uh, David Livingston and Zhou Ji. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank watching you. World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program, we're going to talk to the CEO of the World Animal Protection, who explains the importance of biodiversity. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with me, Tianwei. The program is coming to you from Beijing. The United Nations Sustainable Development Summit will be held on Wednesday. One of the themes is ecological civilization, and biodiversity is an important part of that. While people are ever more aware of the importance of biodiversity, the problems are formidable. Is the awareness raised enough to offset the negative consequences of negligence and ignorance? This is also a question for Steve McClover, who is the CEO of World Animal Protection. Recently, I got a chance to talk to him at the Beijing Nanhai's Mi Lu Sanctuary, which is a protected area for hoofed mammals like the Pier Davis deer. Our conversation started from a visit to the wild area. This place, hmm. monument of extinct species, hmm. quite sad actually. It's actually quite shocking. It really hits you um, when you come here and you see this sort of domino effect of yeah. almost like gravestones, aren't they? Headstones yeah. uh, for the species that once shared this planet with us. Yeah. Even though there's one spotlight mm -hmm. right here yeah. and it could be a happy story. I think it is. It's one of those Pier rare Davis stories. Deer. Yeah, the Pier David's deer. It, it's one of the rare stories now uh, of a deer that was identified here in China. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a native species that was uh, sadly um, wiped out. It became extinct uh, here as a result of, um, well, you know, impacts of uh, wars and, and, and I think the. Uh, uh, politics and, mm. and, and, looting, and, and looting and all yeah. sorts of uh, yeah. impacts uh, mm -hmm. on the deer themselves. The beautiful part of this story is that they, uh, there, were, there was a population of these deer still actually in my home country in the UK yeah. uh, and those deer were brought back here to this very place, the place that we're standing today um, and reintroduced and that small colony of deer yeah now has uh, expanded out over 34 years wow. to three different locations in China yeah. uh, and there are about 5,000 uh, of the deer back uh, here uh, in the country. One of the things that you could see here is where humans, their footsteps are, mm. sometimes it also meant tragically mm. that extinction of certain species. That's very true. Actually, if you look at the bison yeah. as an example there, actually the bison... Oregon bison. Oregon bison, eastern bison, you know, there are certain places or subspecies that um, have disappeared. Um, although the bison hangs on uh, in America. But, you know, they used to be spread across the United States, mm. across Canada, into Mexico. There were millions of bison. Um, roaming uh, and then what happened was that uh, of course people populated uh, and migrated across uh, the US they yeah. built railroads so there were good things there you know this is about people building lives human development human yeah. development yeah. but we have to be careful along the way uh, at the price that nature pays and in the case of the bison, you know, by the end of the 1800s, mm. there were literally just a handful left mm. uh, in the United States. And President Roosevelt 
actually brought in a, uh, a law to protect the bison. Mm. And that's the only reason why they survive today mm. um, and have to coexist with people. Yeah. And it is a difficult challenge, and it's a challenge that China faces as it, as it continues mm. to develop and be economically successful. Right. How do you balance that with protecting nature? <laughs>
and the heating up of our planet um, is causing terrible uh, challenges through natural disasters which are not that natural because they're being um, uh, encouraged if you like they are happening more frequently and more with more severity because of human uh, interactions with nature um, we're seeing the development of of cities uh, urban spaces that are meaning that that wild spaces that fields that forests are being destroyed and in fact if you just looked at the Amazon uh, in Brazil uh, and across that that part of uh, of South America Latin America you know an area of forest the size of the United Kingdom is being destroyed every year and that's an incredible yeah. and, and, and frightening statistic and, and a th the third issue is population growth because more and more people are, are, are hungrily uh, extracting um, uh, you know, food uh, and other resources and that comes at a, a real price for our planet. But Steve, that is reality. We have to face reality whether we like it or not. So what are the solutions for all of this? You earlier talked about in the entertainment industry, but what about the other areas? I think in the other areas we have to take some quite radical action we have to learn from our history. We have to learn from what's happened over the last... Are we learning? I think we're learning, but we're not, uh, we're not, we're not changing our practices at the right scale. Um, so we're learning uh, and, and discovering that the things that we've been doing are causing terrible destruction, uh, the loss of nature uh, uh, and of wild species. And we have some of the answers, but we don't like the answers. Uh, the answers mean that we have to, for instance, change the way our food system works. We have to reduce the amount of, of meat that we're producing in industrial farms yeah. and have a more balanced diet. Um, we also have to protect uh, areas, wild areas and forests because they play a role not just as a commodity, as, as timber, mm -hmm. um, but they play a role as lungs that protect our earth, our planet, our children and our children's right. children. Now there is a balance as the key word you just indicated. What about that balanced diet? What are you advocating? Well as an organization we can see from um, North America as an example but also Europe that people have been um, consuming too much meat as part of their diet and that's creating a whole host of other problems from, from a health point of view you know uh, including um, obesity levels that we've never seen before and the health impacts that come with that. So we're not saying that people can't or shouldn't eat meat, we're saying that they should eat less and actually it should be of a better quality yeah. and those animals should be reared in higher welfare conditions and if we get that right and balance it with uh, you know a, a plant-based diet yeah. uh, then actually that will have a huge positive impact on health, it will have a huge impact uh, on our economies and of course it will protect our climate. Do you think people are listening really? I think that people are reluctant to listen mm -hmm. because it means actually quite profound personal change exactly. but I am seeing a trend that's happening let's hope it's not a fad but we're certainly seeing a trend that's mm -hmm. happening across a lot of the world now where people are shifting to plant-based diets and we're seeing more and more of that food in our stores uh, but it's still a small percentage. Yeah. But Steve, you know, this is the world many believe in great transition. But whether the moment is a great moment or a worrisome moment is unclear. We understand there are already people challenge multilateralism or multilateral platforms even like the organization like yours. So will there be real work that we can work together? So can we really work together? If we don't work together, we will not solve the problems that we face in each of our countries because they are global problems. What does it mean for biodiversity? What does it mean for species protections? Well, it, me it means, for instance, that the solution to climate change can only be found in partnership between China, uh, India, African nation states, uh, Europe, North America. There is no other way of finding 
a real lasting sustainable solution and that applies across all of these issues. Say the United States specifically, instead you say North America. We know at the moment that uh, the US is taking a different path, at least from a sort of political point of view. Um, that doesn't necessarily reflect what many people and institutions feel uh, in the United States or indeed the scientific community. Uh, the scientific community in the US are very clear that the answer will come through intergovernmental work. And I'm confident, I am confident on this, that on that side it's a fad and we will move back to working together because for all our sakes we have to. We are seeing next year China is going to host the International Conference on Biodiversity, very first time. So what would that mean in the way to find the impetus for this largest developing country, together with the others, to focus on something and work together about that? You know, I think it's fantastic. Because next year, um, the fact that, that, that this country is hosting um, the Biodiversity Summit is again a really positive sign. Uh, it's a sign about leadership. So I look forward to coming back next year uh, and seeing how China can help to lead us uh, towards a different and I hope more sustainable path. But of course we will raise our voice and, and challenge um, China just as we will challenge America or European governments uh, where we feel they're not doing enough. Now tradition is hard to die. Some of the traditions, whether with this country or other countries, have something to do with the fate of wildlife as well. So, Steve, how, on the one hand, respect cultures, on the other hand, make sure some of the important costs, such as protecting the species, can also be done in the correct way? That's a really challenging issue. All over the world we face that issue. Um, countries will protect bullfighting, for instance, in Spain, because they say it's a part of their culture. In the UK, of course, they fought for many years to keep uh, the hunting of animals, fox hunting, for instance. We have a, a ban on that, a rather confused ban, but a ban at the moment. In many other countries, we have similar cultures. But of course, you could also argue that um, if we always look at history, then we don't just look at our culture and tradition, but we look often at exploitation and cruelty and practices that we have ended. You know, we, we've moved on now to a place where children are no longer used uh, in uh, the way that they were in low-cost, hard uh, labor environments where their lives were put at risk. We've seen women giving much more power and the ability to, to vote. We've seen changes in so many other ways. People in the past argued that slavery was a part of the, the culture uh, of, those, uh, of those countries. So let's, let's look forwards rather than always backwards. Mm. Let's take some of the things that are precious from our history and right. our culture, but let's also be mindful about being modern citizens uh, that care about um, sustainability, not just uh, history and exploitation. Before we go, I do want to ask you, you know, your job is about creating hope for tomorrow. But at the same time, the nature of your job is to deal with frustrations. The frustration that's challenging wildlife all over the world. So how do you see this part of your life, Steve? I know you've been working hard on this for decades. I have, as have many other people around the world, exactly. and that gives us strength uh, in partnership. Um, yeah, it is, it's a, it is a, the big picture is quite depressing. It, it's very challenging and I, I fear for the world that my children uh, and their children will inherit if we carry on on the path uh, that we are set on at the moment. But I'm an optimist by nature. I have to be because I'm in the, uh, the world of trying to change things for the better. And you know, when I go, wherever I go in the world and I meet people in local communities, in corporates, in, in governments, I see champions for change. I see people who are uh, doing things that uh, will create a better future. So that gives me, that does give me hope. Uh, we just need to listen to that message uh, uh, rather than just shut it down. Mm. What were the recent examples? You know, a, a really nice recent example um, for me was seeing 
uh, some of the biggest companies in the world, so I think something like 40, 45 companies, some of the biggest uh, businesses, uh, actually saying, of course, uh, profitability matters, but actually we do need to change the way that we behave, the way that we source our ingredients. So they signed a pledge uh, to build more sustainable business. And if they can do it and be successful, then others can do it and be successful. So that for me was a really good example uh, in the last few weeks. Thank you so much, Steve. All the best to your cause and to our cause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Xin Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world. Good night.